Thank you. You may be seated. On behalf of the family, uh, we would like to thank you for being here today, showing your love, uh, your respect. Uh, and I want to challenge you that your presence here today serve also as a, a promise, even a, a covenant uh, with this family, that in the days, the weeks, the months to follow, that you will remember them and continually lift them up uh, in your prayers. Uh, many of you can relate to uh, the phrase, the first, uh, the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas, uh, first birthdays uh, that they will be encountering from this moment on. And so as you approach those holidays, those special events, uh, be mindful of them and continue to pray for them uh, as they go through this time. I would like to share with you uh, uh, some excerpts from Psalm 71. And then after you hear these words, uh, I'll lead you uh, in prayer. From uh, Psalm 71, beginning with verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust... Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been held up, held up from the womb. Thou art he who took me out of my mother. My praise shall be continually of thee but I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day for I know not the numbers thereof I will go in the strength of the Lord God I will make mention of thy righteousness even of thine only. O oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not, until I have shown thy strength unto this generation, and thy power to every one that is to come. May we pray. Lord, we call upon you in times such as these. We cry out. For some, our hearts are broken. We deal with sadness. We struggle with loss. And so we cry out to you, Lord, because you understand. And you're always there waiting to comfort, to console, to share that compassionate love that you have for each and every one of us. Holy God, we lift this family up to you today. We pray for your guidance, your protection upon them. And not only this day, but in the days and weeks and months to follow. May they be mindful of your presence and reassured in the salvation that is offered to them through Jesus Christ their Lord. 
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart always be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Delma May Law, 99 years of age, from Daleville, Virginia, finished her earthly journey this past Monday, September 19th, to take residence, might I say permanent, an eternal residence with her Heavenly Father. She was preceded in death by her parents, Cable and Alice Altus, her husband, Clarence Law, a son, Terry Law, siblings, Posey, Nellie, Henry, and Fred Altus, and several nieces and nephews. Delma had a good life, was married to Clarence for 54 years until his passing in 1999. They had three children, Donna, Wanda, and Terry. Sadly, Terry passed away in 2004. Mama worked at ITT until her retirement in 88. She enjoyed retirement, spending it walking the mall with friends and having coffee at Pete's Deli. She lived at the Glebe for the last 10 years and had attained a rock star status surrounded by love from the staff and her precious hospice angels, Sarah Quinlan, Anita Kent, Amanda Gordon, and Kathy Moses. Carrying on her memory are Donna and Dick Grubb, Wanda Craig, her grandchildren, Rhonda, her husband, Jeremy Greer, Chad and wife, Anna Willing, Connie Law, as Connor Law, and his mother, Ellen, and then great-grandchildren, Taylor, Matthew, and Grace Willing, along with Peyton Greer, and a sister, Tootie Wayne Metter. I've known uh, Delma and Clarence and the family my entire life. I can tell you, I, I guess I have permission to tell them about uh, the, the basement incident. Uh, when I was uh, uh, very young, probably 12, 13 years of age, uh, the church where we were members of at Riverdale Baptist uh, was going un uh, under a, a construction phase and we were tearing out the old basement and refurbishing and um, it was summertime and I was hired as a grunt or a gopher doing some of the dirty work there and I do mean dirty it was a very old building so tearing out the walls created a lot of dirt and um, so much so that my mom was a little bit uncomfortable when she picked me up in the evening as dirty as I was loading me up in the car. So uh, Delma and Clarence volunteered to let me use their shower in the basement. And so uh, it was the end of the first day's work. I was dirty and grimy. I went over and Clarence was out in the backyard and he showed me in. And it was a unique thing about that shower in the basement. It was a shower in the basement. That was it. <laughs> there, were, there were no partitions, no walls, no curtain. It was just a shower in the basement. And so there was 12-year-old Roger uh, taking a shower when then entered Delma. And the loud screech that came from my uh, changing voice at the time uh, brought a lot of laughter to Clarence. He said he didn't know I could yell in that high pitch of a voice. Uh, I'll always have that memory, a very fond uh, memory. And both of them were constants uh, there at, at church and uh, never think less of yourself when it comes to the model and the example that you show. I will tell you that young people watch even when they don't realize they're watching. And as I reflect back on Clarence and, and Delma, um, I watch them a lot as a couple being active, and not just being active in church, but loving church, loving folks in the church and being a part of it, an extended family. Uh, it left an indelible mark uh, 
in my life, and I'm very appreciative to the family uh, and to them. Rumor has it, I never had any of her cooking except in potluck issues, but rumor has it uh, she had some yeast rolls that would make Golden Corral envious. And uh, Rhonda understands she also had some good chicken and dumplings. <laughs> Donna, you may think that uh, you loved her more, but you didn't. No. They had a little game, I love you more, and the answer would be no, you don't. No, you don't. She enjoyed uh, a visit, regular visit from Chaplain Gerald uh, with her visit uh, there at the Glebe. She was well loved there. It's a good place to be. She'd often grip Donna's hand and other visitors in a way where you didn't leave until she was ready to let you leave. She had her years at IT&T, which allowed her to make acquaintances uh, with uh, some of my aunts that worked there as well. And, and you talked about uh, uh, walking in, over at uh, Crossroads Mall. Oftentimes my mom would be there with them as well. And, and I, uh, I asked mom several times, do you go there to exercise or is it just to hang out at Pete's and drink coffee? And she wasn't quite sure what the answer was. Um, one of the favorite stories <laughs> that I have to admit I heard uh, from the family was when she was there at Midland, uh, at uh, Melrose Baptist Church, and they had taken pictures for their directory. And when she got her picture for the directory, she didn't like it. It just wasn't her. And so she shared it with her son-in-law, and. He took it down there on the computer, did a little photoshopping, subtracted about 10 years from her life, and there was a Delma like you wouldn't believe, and that's the one that showed up in the church directory. <laughs> so I love that story. It's amazing. And talking about pictures, if you go through the, uh, the old photo albums, you'll notice that uh, every school picture of Donna uh, the night before held a uh, permanent at the house to to get her hair just right. And of course I feel for Donna as a child growing up and every time there's a school picture, oh no, I've gotta have another perm. But I also feel for Clarence having to endure the smell of the perm going through the house. Even in her last days, with a little bit of prodding, Delma knew all the words to happy birthday something that we sing to our children and our friends and our loved ones. And even in her late 90s, I, I, this is a, uh, a message I think I need to carry with me. Even in her light, late 90s, she never forgot that after eating Krispy Kreme donuts, you don't need a napkin. <laughs> you just savor it the old-fashioned way. A lot of good memories, a lot of happy times, family times. And the families asked me to, to open it up to you all, family as well as friends. If you would like to stand where you are and, and share a favorite story or uh, uh, something that uh, spoke to your heart concerning her or her family and, and how you knew each other. The only thing I would ask if you do when you stand is that you speak rather loudly so that everyone can hear. And so I open the floor if anyone would like to share. And don't feel pressured, but uh, we do want to give you that opportunity. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. Let me share with you uh, some scripture from First John chapter four, and it, it kind of serves as a lead 
or segue into a song that you're about to hear from Chris Monroe. And especially this last verse, there's four verses I want to share with you. But I, I, I want to share all four verses so you can hear how intimate the writer is. And when I say the writer, certainly the, the human writer is John, uh, the, the apostle. But God, through Holy Spirit, at work in John's life, writing these words. And I would challenge you to hear these words to yourself when, when you're referred to as a dear friend, or even more so, a dear child. From uh, 1 John 4, beginning with verse 1, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. And then listen how the writer goes not only from dear friends, but now becomes even more passionate, more intimate. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. May we reflect upon that scripture as we hear this song. God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died, to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee 
How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Thank you, Chris. I love uh, contemporary music, Christian music, but uh, I love the old ones too. They really speak to us. Speaking of old ones, let me share with you a verse of scripture from the Old Testament from a prophet who spoke some 700 years before Jesus was even born. In Isaiah 51, Verse 6, we hear these words. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. The heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment. And its inhabitants die like flies. Wow. Wow doesn't necessarily put a smile on your face. Except that's not the end of the verse. There's a contraction there. And he goes on to say, and this is God speaking through the prophet to us all, but my salvation will last forever and my righteousness will never fail. You see, the story of God's love and salvation for us, although it was manifested and presented in human form in and through Jesus, that love and that salvific plan was there very early on. Matter of fact, you can find it in Genesis chapter 3. And here the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, is proclaiming that God's salvation will last forever. And the best part about that idea of forever is that it has no beginning and it has no end. Delma rests within that salvation that lasts forever. It has no end. And there is a righteousness that will never fail. We live in a time where we wonder um, if the good guy wins in the end. That's how you always knew it was the end of a movie in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. When the good guy wins, you knew to go and get your stuff together. The lights are getting ready to come up and we can leave. It's not necessarily the truth anymore in, in reality in this world. And, and so we... We find ourselves kind of scratching our heads and wondering, is this the end or not? Is there more? And we are assured from words that were penned some 2,700 years ago that God's salvation lasts forever and that God's righteousness will not fail. The good guy does it win in the end. But to fast forward 700 years, from after Isaiah penned those words. I'd like to share with you from John chapter 15. And, and John 15, uh, most of us know that as far as uh, this, this segment of scripture where Jesus is telling us to bear fruit and uh, that there may be some pruning involved so that we can bear more fruit. We usually associate John 15 with that, but this is later on in John it, it picks, uh, 15. It picks up in verse 11. And I want you to hear what, how this starts, what Jesus says. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. 
Jesus doesn't just wish the disciples and us to be happy. Jesus doesn't even wish the disciples and us to be joyful. Jesus wishes that the joy that we have is the joy that Christ himself has and that in us it is made complete. Delma may have thought about that at times in her life. The difference between happiness and joy. What it feels like when possibly our joy is being robbed. Uh, David prayed in Psalm 51, Restore in me the joy of thy salvation, O God. But I can assure you this. Delma now understands what it's like to have that joy made. Completed and come into to fruition in a way that human minds cannot even envision. Jesus went on in verse 12 to tell us one of the ways that we can start allowing that joy to be made complete in our lives. And it's something that our world really needs to hear today. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But I have this caveat. I never say John 3.16 without following it up with John 3.17, which many people forget or never even bother to learn. And that is, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Christ did not come with condemnation. Christ came with love. A love that was so straight, so strong and even strange in this day and time that even shares it here in John 15. Greater love hath no one than to lay down his life for his friends. And you say, well, that's easier said than done, Roger, because you don't know my life. I'm no friend of Jesus. I'm going to read on, but I think you may be wrong in that. Picking up with verse, thir- uh, verse 14. Jesus declares these words, You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. If you key in on nothing else that I share with you this this afternoon, hear these words. From verse 16 of John 15. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you. And appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. You did not choose me. But I chose you. Many years ago, I was in a new assignment in my job. I hadn't been there long. And I was called to the office by actually the top boss there at the site. And as I walked into her office, I was told to close the door. I wasn't feeling good about this at all. I closed the door and I was so intimidated I didn't sit down. I waited until I was invited to sit down. And I sat down and then the boss said, I'm going to be your mom. Now I was scared. If she knew my mom. (laughs) I said, okay. I'd never been fired or terminated before, so I'm like, okay, is this what it feels like? 
She leaned across her desk and, and she looked me straight in my eyes. And she says, I want you to know something. I nodded. And she said, someone is fishing for you. I had no idea what that meant. And I'm sure my look told her that. I, I don't know what that means. Here's what she was telling me. Someone is passionately pursuing you. And in the days and the weeks and the months to come, I would meet, fall in love with, and marry my wife. And many years later, I am so thankful that I was passionately pursued, that I was fished for. She tells me that she snagged me with no bait on the hook. But you know what? I don't know what I'm more thankful for. The fact that I was passionately pursued or the fact that I slowed down enough to be caught. You see, I had to have both of those to have a a happy, loving marriage years later. I share that story with you because that's exactly what happens. When I hear these words, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I see Christ passionately pursuing each and every one of us. And trust me, it's not because of. It's not because you're so attractive. It's not because you make sure you get a perm before you get a school picture. It's in spite of. God, Jesus in the flesh, loves each and every one of us in spite of. Pastor? Pastor? God loved me. God pursued me. Not because of anything, but in spite of my sin. In spite of my weakness. In spite of my faults. You did not choose me. But I chose you. Delma was not perfect. None of us are. But she was passionately Pursued by a loving God and slow down enough to be caught. And you know when you're caught. Even a three year old child knows when they're caught. That lamp was broken even before I was born. They know. But when you slow down enough, and yield and surrender to a loving God who passionately pursues you. You know it. And you know you've been caught by one who will never do you any harm. One who will never let you down. One whom you can always trust in and upon. A rock, a refuge, a solace, even in troubling times. The scripture declares in 1 Timothy 2.4, God wants all men to be saved. All people. The desire is that all of us be saved. God passionately pursues us. You know, we don't use that word passion because we usually associate that with other earthly things. God's love is so great, I do use the words passionate and intimate. Even in our worst of times, Times when we think we're all alone. Times when we're saying goodbye to a loved one. Times when our hearts are broken. When we feel like we've been betrayed and let down. Cheated. Whatever the case may be. You need to understand that there is a loving God who passionately pursues you. And wants you to slow down just long enough to be called be saved to 
be loved, to be comforted, reassured, directed and guided through a crazy world. And when your time comes, be it at 35, 70, or 99, wonderful years, to know that God's salvation lasts forever and that God's righteousness will never fail. Jesus pursues us. And I pray that you understand what I'm sharing with you today. That you understand it in a way of not like it makes sense. The love I have for my wife and her for me. Well, I can't speak for her, but my love for her sometimes doesn't make sense. But that's okay because love supersedes definition sometimes. Human words that we can put in it. I don't want you to understand it. I think what God wants is for you to feel that you have been caught by the one who loves you. The one who passionately pursues you. The one, if you're quiet long enough, even in the midst of the storm, can hear those reassuring words, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Chris Monroe and Joyce Sarver are going to share a song with you that basically tells you that in the midst of those storms, in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those struggles that we go through, in the midst of grieving, loss, and mourning, there's a passionate pursuer. There's a Jesus who loves you, who died for you, who rose again for you, and so wants to make you his own. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand I start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus I can see it then, but I can see it now. Well, it was Jesus. In the waiting, in the searching, in the healing and the hurting, like a blessing buried in the broken pieces. Every minute, every moment,
searching in the healing and the hurting like a blessing buried in the broken pieces I can tell you in my life, I've had some dark days. Ones like the prophet Elijah that uh, I'd have been fine if I was called home. Some of them were days that were made darkened by my own actions and decisions or lack thereof. But I can't look back and find one that I didn't have Jesus there. I hope you understand that. I pray that you do. And if you don't, I'm here for you. So that I can help you to turn your gaze to the one who calls you friend to the one who chose you, to the one who passionately pursues you, to the one that can save you. I'm so thankful that Delma knew Jesus because even in the midst of our tears and our sadness today, there's also celebration. For God's salvation is forever. It is eternal. I'm going to close us in prayer. And when I finish the prayer, I'm not going to say amen because we're used to saying, okay, now we've ended the story and we can move on. Instead, there will be no amen. So that as we leave this place, we leave in a mode of prayer. If it's to go to our next appointments or home, prayer as we continue to lift the family up. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then perhaps it would be a prayer of you inviting him into your life to save your soul and to be the Lord of your life. And I will help you in any way possible in making that happen. Let's pray. There was Jesus. Not just at that nativity scene that we'll be embracing in a few days. Not visiting with the ladies in the garden after the resurrection. But on that cross, choosing each and every one of us And still today, pursuing us with a passionate, intimate, compassionate love. And Jesus, I call upon that love to comfort this family. To abide in them. To protect them. To guard them and, and deliver them through this time. as they go to a place where physically they will say goodbye. May you remind them that the Spirit lives on and that Delma, mom, sister, grandma, great-grandma knew you 
and lives eternally in that righteousness and that salvation. Lord, I lift up anyone here today who does not know you. And I pray that you, Holy Spirit, will plant the seeds in their hearts, that you will remind them that there you are, passionately pursuing them because you love them. Go with us from this place. Grant us your mercy and your grace. And for the family and those going to the cemetery, a safe journey. And we ask these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior. In the name of the one who loves us. In the name of Jesus.